a quorum of the city council and school committee being present, um, I'll call this meeting to order and I'll le read the joint notices. By order of Her Honor Mayor E. Denise Simmons, acting in accordance with Chapter 1, Section 3.2 of the Rules of the School Committee, there will be a roundtable working meeting of the City Council and School Committee on Monday, March 28, 2016, 5.30 and 7.30 p.m. in the Media Cafeteria, CRLS 416, 459 Broadway Street in Cambridge. The call for the City Council, the City Council roundtable working meeting with the School Committee, no public comment, no votes will be taken. Meet a uh, meeting will not be televised, but please, I to, am to inform you that this meeting is being videotaped, I believe. Videotaped, audio taped. People might take pictures, Instagrams, Twitter. Um, okay. So I want to thank everyone for being here this uh, afternoon. We're, we're having this meeting for a couple of reasons, but the, the, the chief reason is an opportunity for us to to launch this term in a way that's collaborative. So it's really about working together. I've talked to many of you on both sides of the aisle about how do we can foster better working, relation, working relationships because even though we have separate jurisdictions, we do have some shared jurisdiction as well. And so that's why we are launching this, which is gonna be one of, I hope, several meetings. And the second part of this meeting, you all have agendas in front of you. We're gonna look at some of the things that we want to talk about over the next two years and, and make every attempt to, to get to those in an orderly, relaxed, collegial fashion. Before I jump into our agenda, I just want to take an opportunity to acknowledge two people in particular this evening. That's Mr. Richard Rossi and Jeffrey Young, our superintendent. Uh, as you know, as you all know, both these gentlemen are going to be leaving us. And this is the first time we've actually kind of been together in a while since they've made those announcements. And I just want to say for the record in this collaborative meeting of school committee and city council, I personally want to thank each of you for your service. And we're going to make you work overtime. <laughs> but very seriously, we, we do thank you both for your service. Um, <laughs> we've had the benefit of having, having you for uh, a while working in for our families in our city. And uh, although the time that we, you have is now, we have a finite date. We, I still enjoy and look forward to working with you over the next several months. And I think I could speak for my colleagues in saying the same. So I just wanted to say thank you to each of you. Did you want to say anything before I launch us off? Because if you only get five minutes, you can use your five minutes now. <laughs> I'll say less than that, uh, Madam Mayor. I just say thank you to everybody for many years of what I would say is great collaboration and coordination. I uh, really appreciate working with Jeff and Jimmy and Claire and their entire team, and also uh, the respect that's always been shown to us on the city side by the school committee. I just want to thank you all for that, and, and to Carolyn, who's been here for many, many years along with us, to just to say how really I think the tasks are difficult at times, but I think for Cambridge it's really an enjoyable. Uh, job and it's it's great to be able to be part of making this a better school system and, and better city. Thanks. I'll just uh, give the kind of mirror image of what uh, Manager said. I uh, second his motion. Um, it really has been a pleasure. Never easy, but still very important work. And uh, we appreciate uh, the council and the school committee's uh, interest in uh, working collaboratively. Uh, certainly, from our perspective, at a staff level. Um, you mentioned some folks over there in the uh, school department. I want to also just uh, single out Gina and Lisa and Ellen, possibly. Um, people I've gotten to know uh, reasonably well over these years and uh, have the uh, highest respect and esteem. And uh, not to mention you, both in your uh, previous role, but now especially your role as manager. Um, uh, I'd like to think that we have found good ways to uh, do the right thing. And again, thank you again. So what's the purpose of this meeting? Again, the purpose of this meeting is for us to, to I'm hoping to forge a collaborative relationship between the school committee and the city council, look at in terms of our working meetings, looking for shared agenda items, knowing that we're not going to be able to talk about everything that might come to us or under the sun, but if we can find specific things that we might want to talk to so I can with the Vice Mayor and the Vice Chair, uh, Vice Mayor of the City Council and Vice Chair of the School Committee craft an agenda going forward of issues that we can speak on. It's important, it says Plan E, to understand what, what our, govern, our governing document is the Plan E Charter, which gives 
jurisdictional responsibilities to the city council and to the school committee. The city council is given its power under Mass General Law 43, subsection 97. The school committee is given their jurisdictional powers under chapter 43, subsection 33. And they're very much the same in that the city council takes care of the issues of the city and the school committee, the school committee issues in terms of policies and procedures. I say that because it's important to note that when it comes to, and this is the important part, the attitude or the, of, uh, the item of the budget, the city council really has no jurisdiction over the school department's budget other than to vote it up or down. We can't add, we can't take away. The other side is the school committee cannot influence our budget. And I just think it's important that we, we resonate, remember to know that how do I say, how do we work toward a same goal, which is the bene benefit of the citizens and the children and the families, but also remember that we need to stay in our own lanes. And so that's a little bit what I want to kind of put out there before both bodies. So as we continue to work together and go over the things that we do share in common, that we are better when we work together. So having said that, uh, one of the things I thought was very important let me just stop. Does anyone have any questions around that? <coughs> okay, thank you. One thing I thought was important that we talk about this evening, uh, and that we have Richie and Lisa and the school department fiscal people here, and the city's fiscal people here as well, to just to get an update of where we are on the Cambridge Street Upper School and the, what building is it? The King Open Building. <coughs> We're going to have a presentation by Lisa Ritchie, the superintendent, and Dr. Turk, and then we'll have questions after that. And just in terms of our operational procedure, and everyone is, is, should feel free to ask a question. Five minutes, you're allotted. We'll want to go around, let everyone talk at least once before we go around again. Okay? Any questions? Very good. So if I, I'm going to have Lisa, uh, is that what's going Lisa, on? you got it. Okay, so um, the Cambridge Street, um, the King Open Cambridge Street Upper School and Community Complex, because I think for people, I think most people have been sort of engaged in it one way or another, but not only does it include the two schools, it also includes preschool, community schools, after school, the Valenti Branch Library, the Gold Star Pool, um, and also a really significant open space that we're trying to look at what the relationship is between that. Um, we're just completing the feasibility study, and um, as a part of that feasibility study, we're also looking at whether the school administration building could fit in that project. And, um, you know, I think from a spatial perspective and everything, it looks like the school administration project does work well. <coughs> it is about a 20,000 square foot uh, facility. It would be a separate building with a separate entrance, or sort of entering off of uh, Berkshire Street. Um, before we sort of um, make the final sort of recommendation and determination on that, I think we are still trying to finalize some of what we think are the parking implications on street. It does look like it works. I think that's mostly what we wanted to sort of talk about today is that, um, and it isn't an additional cost, even though the additional cost I think is seems reasonable. The school administration with an additional 20 parking spaces, because all the parking spaces would be below ground, is about an additional $10 million. Which really is, for a 20,000 square foot facility, I think is probably a pretty reasonable cost when you think about an alternative of having to acquire land and having to build on that. Um, I should say just, I think, um, consistent with the net zero plan that the city council adopted this year, we are building this building as a net zero building, which really has very significant implications for how we're looking at the building and how we're designing the building. Um, it is a building that will be sourced by geothermal wells exclusively. There'll be no carbon, there'll be no oil or gas that are going, that's going into the building. Uh, PV arrays and an assortment of, um, of other um, sustainability features. Um, it's 
but and also I guess I would say is that the square originally we were feeling the building would be around 220,000 square feet. We're now, if we include the school administration building, at a 266,000 square foot facility. Again, that includes about 20,000 square feet for the school administration building, and the remainder are increases. You know, some in, we're you know, adding another preschool. There's some additional space for the human service program. Um, a little bit more space for the pool, for the Valente Library. I should say the voting is now going to take place in the library and not in the school. So I think that will be an improvement for the public and from the school perspective. Um, and then also for the school facility, I think most of the increased space is because of additional special education classrooms and the OLA program. So I think I'll leave it at that if there's other questions that people have. Okay, so the floor is open for folks to ask any questions that they may have. The, the only thing I would add, Madam Mayor, so this would be uh, fully supported by debt, and it is part of our uh, debt program that we have in our five year capital. Mr. Superintendent, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, just operationally, I'll add, I'll ask Mr. Maloney if he wants to weigh in a little bit here. <clears throat> but I just want to note that, uh, again, thanks uh, to the support of the city, um, we were able to accept <coughs> the move out of that building, right, of two, uh, two faculties at the King Open as well as the Cambridge Street Upper to their uh, various uh, swing spaces as, uh, as this project uh, gets underway. I want to just take a minute here in front of this group uh, to acknowledge uh, the work not just of Mr. Maloney and his team to, to actually execute that, but of the, uh, the really goodwill and cooperation and patience and great spirits of the, uh, the school staff and both of those buildings as well as the families, uh, many of whom on the days that Mr. Maloney and I went to visit, you could see uh, parents there in the schools either providing food or just cheering people on as they were packing and unpacking crates, uh, very powerful. Uh, community building exercise. Uh, although that wasn't part of the design, it turned out to be one of the, uh, mm -hmm. the high points from my perspective. I don't know if Mr. Maloney would like to add anything to that. <coughs> Jimmy, no, I, want I to would add? say that um, I think it's important uh, for everybody to recognize that the driver of the uh, program and the feasibility piece uh, are the teachers of the school. Virtually every teacher at the King Open and at the Cambridge Street, as were the teachers coming together for the, for the current King on the math building, have been involved in hundreds of hours of uh, input meetings with the architects. Um, and they are certainly the people who will be there the most, uh, and it's their thoughts that matter the most to us and, and the feasibility piece of this project. Thanks, Jim. Okay. So Leland and I, I was, Dennis. Uh, really quickly, I'll just say I'm very pleased um, with the, the, the vision for the school, but I've been asking to, I think, incorporate the administration into a school. I'm glad to see that. I think I'm very happy also about uh, the idea of doing more early ed uh, within the school. Um, that's great. I think just um, I'm very, and that's zero uh, building. We're all very happy. I think just uh, to the chair and to the vice mayor and the co-chair about something to talk about in the future, I think we're scared. We're, we have a very ambitious school building plan. Um, you know, we're staring, but on the we're staring down the gun, uh, the barrel of a very real uh, political threat that could lead to an economic contraction um, with the election of Trump. Um, and uh, quite seriously, so if there is an econ economic contraction, I want to make sure that we don't wind up seeing ourselves in a position where we're over leveraged um, and unable to, to uh, put to some of the schools the kind of resources that we're accustomed to and would like to do so in the going forward. So just like some scenario or sensitivity analysis around how the capital budget and what we're anticipating for this school and, and the schools down the road, uh, could how that could impact the operational budget of the city if there is, you know, worst comes to worst. So that's, I think, just something for mm -hmm. probably expanded <laughs> discussion in the future. Okay, thank you. I, I meant to ask this we have new members uh, on the school committee and the city council. And is everyone familiar with everybody on the, on the, from the administrative <laughs> sides of the aisle? Yeah, no? Why don't we just take a row, if anyone. <laughs> so I know people hate to do this, but it, if we just said who we were, and if you're a city person or a school department person, it might be helpful. So, and then we'll come back to you, Dennis, right That's after. Fine. But you are, who are you? I'm, I'm still Dennis Carlone <laughs> and a city council. Fred Fantini, school committee. Dan Devereaux, city council. Emily Dexter, school committee. Craig Kelly, city council. Kathleen Kelly, school committee. Ellen Samanoff, I think I might be school department. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Peterson, Deputy City Manager. Louis Pasquale, Assistant City Manager for Finance. Gina Franconi, Budget Director. 
Chair. Yeah, Mr. Lieutenant. There's Spinner C of both of the school departments. Richard Harding, school committee. Patty Nolan, school committee. Mark McGovern, city council. I thought you're the vice mayor. I'm the vice mayor, yes. Yeah. Paula Crane, deputy city clerk. Donna Lopez, city clerk. Judy Martin, executive secretary Yay. of the school committee. Denise Simmons, mayor, and then. Carol Hunter, deputy city Jim Maloney, city department. Nancy Schneider, city mother. <laughs> Uh, David Meyer, City Councilor. Uh, Leland Shaw, City Person, but September I will be a school person. Okay. Oh, my daughter's in school in September. So now, Dennis, you have the floor. Thank you. You're welcome. Good call. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Just a, a few a quick questions. So 266,000 square feet, I heard that. And do I remember it's about 100 parking spaces? Yeah, I didn't mention. We're if we include um, an allocation of 20 spaces for the school administration, it would be 105 underground spaces. And a huge benefit of that from the community perspective is putting the surface lots underground, I just want to say, is that we can add over an acre of open space there which is phenomenal for the community. You know, it, it creates a little bit more of a parking challenge that we're trying to figure out. But yeah. <laughs> if we were to add more underground parking, it's about 70,000 space. Yeah. That's so not, as high as not as high as normally, no. because you're already down there. And there is room. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we and have and the total cost, um, did you I didn't say that here. Right now, Total, what we're looking at, if we include school administration and it, which again is only 10 million of it, we about 157 million. <coughs> 157. 157. Which, you know, whoa. Yeah. So that's uh, in the ballpark of 450. 465. So 500 square feet. Okay, I was getting up there. You were there. getting there, yeah. But I, didn't, I didn't want to broach that number. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems, I don't know, that yeah. seems comparable um, in this day and age. So this isn't just a school, right? Yeah, so this because is a library and a pool. Yeah, high end. I and get it. And consistent yeah. with Martin Luther King's numbers. Yeah. It is. Yes. Okay. And the net zero aspect of I mean, you yeah. know I'm a big net yeah. zero yeah. fan, but. Yeah. But uh, I don't believe, as I mentioned to you the other day, we have to be 100% yeah. on site. So the net mm -hmm. zero. Well, we're aiming for that. Yeah, I know you yeah. are. But yeah. I, if, yeah. if we're losing other yeah. opportunities, yeah. I question it. Because yeah. there's other ways to get to net zero, <coughs> not on site. Um, do we have an idea of what the net zero impact is? The cost, maybe? Yes. Yeah, the cost is, as we're talking about, like, the geothermal wells, the PV systems and all that, it's about $12 million. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you, Bert. We'd have to net out. If it wasn't net zero, <laughs> you'd have more, you Operating know, costs. natural gas and boiler and all that, mm. so or, or still. Okay, or I, won't, I won't go on. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Patty? Thanks. Um, Couple questions. One, if maybe more, uh, Jeff could explain how we're ensuring flexibility in programming, given that our enrollment has been changing over time. We have much larger first grades. It may be that eventually we're going to have to do. We've talked about this, the some reconfiguration at our middle grade level. So this, and as I understand it, this is the only <coughs> site with such flexibility in terms of building of all the ones that we're considering because of the open space and, and the zoning. So I am I know the program has been, teachers have been involved, but I think if we could hear a little bit more about how we're ensuring that we are building flexibility into this building here, both for early education, but also in case we need additional upper school classrooms or others, because I know that was seen as, as important for this particular site because this is one that is underbuilt. It's the only one of all of our buildings, our school buildings at least, that are underbuilt vis-a-vis -vis zoning. Um, yeah. I think um, 
that has been something that's been important to Mr. Maloney. He certainly right. talked about flexibility, so I don't know if you want to talk about it in terms of having What's attended most of those 60-plus yeah, so meetings. So there's lots of flexibility. Uh, our very first meeting on the school side with the <laughs> architects, uh, well over a year ago now, um, the one thing we asked them for was the same thing we asked the architects at the King Building, that the building be built flexible enough so that if a future school committee or city council wanted to make changes in the structures, that would be possible. I think it's um, within reason we want to ask for as that much additional be. space as one can get, but as the city manager has said, that we're already at two something in square footage, and there's only you know so much square footage you can get at, at, at any one at any one building. So the building is being designed from at our request and you know, the city's agreement so that there's flexibility for future use if they if five or ten years down the road it was a duck. There's that said there's there's not seven or eight classrooms that are being built just to be just to held in, in the bank. Case. We have some other thoughts that the city manager and Lisa and I have had discussions about as we move forward to other buildings that are in the queue, so to speak, mm -hmm. that should, should we get to the, <coughs> the economy, that would give us some flexibility. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think that's a, if we get to them, I think we all, I know we all want to, and I think it's really important we make sure that this project doesn't end the funding for school projects, because we have not just other school buildings that might be, uh, require totally redoing, like the, the current Vassal Lane structure, but we actually have a number of other school buildings that are in desperate need of more in the mm -hmm. 10 to 20 million dollar overhaul that are really behind code, they're behind a lot of different um, educational, uh, we we're not able to provide the educational programming in the same level of uh, student <coughs> Uh, programming that I think we'd like to. So I, I know you're aware of that. I know we're all aware of that. We just want to make sure it's it's something we can continue to afford, given that this project is taking. Um, I want to follow up on the net zero. I'm as all of us are, and I've championed it for years. The current King Building had a goal of net zero, and, I, and when I was there, it's about 43 percent is being produced on site. And yet, one of the things that we talked about is that we're going to learn from that. Is the expectation that maybe we'll get to more like the 60 or 70 percent true net zero on this project? I know we're aiming for 100, but we if, so we think we might be able to get there because that's what. Yeah, I, think so. I mean, the question is honestly, when we're talking about what um, Councillor Carlone is talking about, we're also working towards getting to 100 percent renewable energy from our electrical right. supply. So, you know, if we say that's three years out or maybe four mm -hmm. years out, you know, that's going to be this, you have electricity that's going to be sourcing the building. So if we get to 80% PV coverage on the building, we'll get to 100% through the renewable energy. And that's I think exactly. that's exactly. the electric yeah. supply. That's exactly. So that's what we are looking at all of that. That's great. Yeah, but yeah, number two, the, the uh, King School on Putnam now. Pretty much a straight up building. Right. Right. It didn't have as much space. It, it had more constraints space. on the site, right? I mean, yeah. uh, just yeah. two other things. So, over and above this, and the fact that we are committed to other schools in our capital plan for the out years, um, you know, we, I think, have learned in the last year there is a real concern over security in general in all our schools mm -hmm. and city buildings. And we're working on a plan now <coughs> to put together some money, which really <coughs> hasn't shown up anywhere. But that could be, you know, uh, as much as eight, ten million dollars, all mm -hmm. said and done, that we will have to somehow um, put together. I think the other thing is, as we go from one new school to the next, I think we learn a lot about what some of the issues are, and it really begs for us to continue, I think, our strong collaboration and communication so that we work out all these growing pains in all these buildings, and um, just to make sure that. So I think if the, if the, superintendent and the city manager are on the same page and then the program leaders are on the same page and the teachers, the principals, etc. I think that will be a better process for the future and that's something we've been trying to work on now to get better at it as we move to these new schools. And when you say you're for the future building projects, I know you're talking about new schools, but are we haven't talked specifically about the need for existing schools to be renovated or and well, I think we've or is that? We've, we've had discussions. Okay, yeah, so that's yeah, on the table, and that's something. I mean, I think we have to. So we don't. We don't start just a do little the more schools, detail. right? Right. If you look at the capital budget, you'll see allocations for boilers, for right. roofs, for windows, etc. So right. we're trying to keep up with that 
too. But we need I, to I would say it's quite, those. it is quite an aggressive schedule that we all need to right. pay attention to and keep our eyes on. Because yeah. there is this other side of the world. It's called the city side, right? Yes. They have a few needs. And we're very grateful. <laughs> Red does that. Anything else? No, thank you. Ms. Kelly? Yeah. Definitely. So, Jim, if you stand up, it's a little right, better so, to hear you. So, the building, the building has several components. Um, there is capacity, there's enrollment, and enrollment capacity are two very different things. And there's a little bit of growth <laughs> in there. Right now, the two schools combined probably have an enrollment of about 600 students. Um, I'm going to give you a round number that I'm going to I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head. Um, but some classrooms might, you know, classrooms are built for 25, which is our contractual capacity, right. and 20 uh, at the kindergarten level. Um, and if there's only 20 kids in there, so you have your capacity, and you have your enrollment numbers. Then what, to uh, I think uh, Ms. Nolan's earlier question, what opportunities are there for growth there? Um, we, again, it's, it's a site as large as it is. Um, <coughs> we can't build all of our, as much as we might all want to build all of our potential growth on one site. That's not <laughs> the best for that site. That's not the best for the school. Um, and it's probably not the best for the kids. There is a little bit of growth in there for at the lower level. Because as Ms. Nolan mentioned, it's her concern at the middle school level, the upper school. We're actually facing the potential of, of serious squeeze at the middle school starting right. this coming September. Because but also right. we're very squeezed at the uh, uh, K to five level, yeah. particularly the K to three level. So we've included at least one more classroom in there, and we've begun discussions, um, uh, as I said earlier, about other ways that we could alleviate some of our space crunches that we're facing right now. And just as a follow-up, it's, it's being designed as sort of two separate Two completely buildings, separate buildings. Sort of one building with this, it's, again, one building with separate areas, as much standalone as possible, but with the reality that principals like a little bit of interaction between the two uh, structures, the, the grades of kids, and also some <coughs> common facilities like uh, cafeterias and, and, and uh, the media box area, the libraries. We have a community meeting on March 3rd. What's the date of that again? 31st. The 31st. Thursday. This Thursday. This Thursday. This Thursday. Thursday. Okay. Other questions or comments? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Just, right. just, a, just a quick observation. I think the enrollment issue is a, is a, is a key issue. Um, in, the, in the town next door, the town of Arlington, they just finished building a new building, and um, they found out that they're already <coughs> shot on enrollment and had to bring in modulars to kind of support the school. So I just say that as a way that uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to keep your eye on. And, and that wasn't even a five-year projection. That was right after they finished building it, they're needing more so, so it's right. something to, uh, something to take into account. And don't tell anybody I mentioned She was running that show over there for Was that? <laughs> well, that's, that's probably, left, probably has a lot to do with it, Mark, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Other discussion? Uh, Jim, what do you anticipate going out five years? What, is, what does our enrollment look like? Uh, 
time. Actually, I think the exact numbers Claire has, and she's looking up right now, and Patty has as well. Do you want them? <coughs> so we're, we're looking at enrollment growth um, by 2020 uh, of about another, um, uh, let's say, 400 students um, from 66, 78 in the current year, excuse me, from 67 to 75 in the current year, to 71, 49, five years And that's out. mostly K through five. I'm sorry? And that's mostly K through five. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, as you know, we've experienced a lot of growth yeah. here, um, uh, but the, the lower grades, uh, recent, our, our kindergarten lottery uh, that was just held a, in, uh, a couple of weeks ago had 603 uh, registrants, which was the most um, in the last 15 or 20 years, except for one year, which was just two years ago. So the growth is really coming mm -hmm. from the bottom up. And what about our middle school? Are, is that numbers, are those numbers growing as well, or is this, where are you seeing the growth? Uh, we're seeing the growth at the, the primary growth at two levels mm -hmm. um, in the K to three area, and historically in the last few years at the high school. Okay. Middle schools haven't shown a lot of growth. There's been a little. Up, there's been no real um, statistically um, significant change either way in the middle schools. It's been fairly stable. A little up, a little down, mostly a little down. Um, what we're looking at though is. And what we don't know is as that enrollment that's grown so much at the K one two three level right. that I think so a little while ago, that's starting to put pressure on our upper schools. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly right now, next year sixth grade is something that Claire and I have been working with our family resource center about right now because we, we are a little concerned about that. Thank you, Mr. Harding. Yeah, just just quickly, just for the city council to sort of understand. So, one of our sort of bigger schools, the Grand Park, is about three sixty two. So 400 students is almost like a whole nother school in our right. world. So just to help the council members understand the, you know, in real time what it looks like, it looks like almost if we were to put another school online, the amount of kids that Mr. Mullen just projected, just to kind of help my colleagues understand that if they didn't already. And if I could just add to Jim. Mr. Harding, that's on top of over 700 new students in the last eight or, eight or so oh, years. Right. So mm -hmm. combined, we're talking about now we had some capacity to absorb that, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but, but we also closed um, two buildings uh, 12 years ago. So our ability to continue to absorb that is all but gone. Mm -hmm. Over how many years? 12 years, 12 years ago. 12 years ago. 12 years ago. 2002. Three. Three. <laughs> you don't remember that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Uh, thank you. And this is something that that Craig talks about, but he's eating a piece of pizza over there, so I'm gonna I'll jump in. <laughs> Um, in your projections for enrollment, are you, we don't really, we don't really fully understand what the new housing that we're building here, I mean, we're, we, you know, we'll be building 5,000 units of, of new housing in, you know, in the upcoming years and granted most of that is not going to be families necessarily, but even a two bedroom could have one or two, you know, two children and, um, and as Mr. Harding said, you know, even yeah. even even, four, even 400 that. kids out of those 5,000, you're talking about a new school. Right. So, have, do you do you take into account what the potential growth would be in terms of new housing, or are you just looking at what <coughs> what the birth records are and where those kids will will be five years out? Mostly, it's just historical trends. I think one of the issues with housing that that we've had some discussions with. Um, is the location of housing. Um, the housing that's, that's gone in is sort of the periphery of the city. Um, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's expensive to go get small numbers of kids. Um, you can imagine going out to Elwood um, to get a handful of children at rush hour. We get a fair amount of complaints from, from parents um, about that, and as well as Deep East Cambridge uh, at the North Point. So those areas, if you look at uh, our transportation, <coughs> they've been had an impact small numbers of children in more isolated areas to get to. But that's where it is going, right? So that we're going to have to figure out how to manage that and, and some, you know, add those, what we what we might be able to predict for, for kids who might enter the public. Those have to be factored into the numbers yeah, somewhere. the more kids that are there, the unit cost is going to decrease. I mean, if we're, if we're chasing 10 to 15 kids right now, and we all of a sudden we're chasing 100 right. kids. That space issue, but from a transportation standpoint, Right, transportation it helps, but classroom size you're going to end up you could end up with a lot more kids. I want to uh, welcome school committee member Monika Bowman. Uh, 
Councilor Nadine Mazin and Councilor Tim Toomey. Do any of you want to add to this discussion at all? This is really open the floor and just whatever is on your mind, it's a good time to get it out. Well, two things. One is uh, I think we learned at Putnam <coughs> Avenue how well um, architects can break up the massing to make a large building feel more comfortable on the street and with its neighbors. And I give the city and the school department and the leadership a lot of credit. And the beauty of the diagram that Lisa shared with us on the new program on Cambridge Street is the same possibilities are there, and I'm assuming that's a goal to make the facades fit in as much as possible and on the crescent on Cambridge Street with the different uses you have. It's ideal for that and it really becomes a village center. Um, and I think on Putnam too it feels more like that. And I, I think that is tremendous. That's exactly the way to go. As far as new growth that <coughs> counts the vice mayor brought up, um, I hope in Alewife, where there's a capacity of 3,000 more people living, and there might be a commuter rail, that the city and its plans look at a school site in the middle of that because for two reasons. One is the p future need, and all these new buildings that don't have families in it, in 20 years, that'll be quite different. Uh, that's when buildings become more affordable. Um, so there will be families and even the new buildings eventually. But we need a communal center in Alewife, and the school to me is the basis, the beginning basis of, of that, when you have 3,000 people living there, fairly isolated given the state roads around it. Um, so I hope in the long-term plan, the Envision Plan and the School Plan that we do look at that because it's it's essential. North Point at least is near East Cambridge, um, although one can make an argument North Point should have a small school as well. Thanks. Thank it's you. going to be. It, it almost feels like a small city into itself. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about how do we make North Point feel more part of East Cambridge, and Definitely. I just don't know. I don't see how that happens. It feels very isolated. It feels very off to itself um, as other, what do we have coming in there? We have a restaurant, uh, a ton talks of retail. About retail, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see five years from now what that really looks like, you know, and what kind of impact that has on the eastern part of the city. Uh, just curious, are uh, the timeline, uh, with the King School, that little, Faux pas, we'll call it, that we had. Um, are we. Fire pas. Fire pas, right. Are we pretty much still on schedule with our overall plan? When do we see uh, the um, Cambridge Street building being finished and given no more fire pars or anything like that? So, our original plan was to open in September of 19. That's still up. So, we were able to make that. Okay. I have to tell you, I, I'm pleased about the idea of the, administra the administration building going there. Yes. Um, I remember a thousand years ago, back when David and I were young and thin, uh, and on the school committee, <laughs> we talked about it then, you know, where, where is a place to put the administration building? So I'm, I'm actually very, very pleased to see it, it, it go in there. Um, It'll be interesting what happens to the building after that, but I'm, I'm just pleased, so I'm, I'm glad you're moving uh, forward with that. Let's, can we go back to the King School for a moment? Okay, just another one point. Though. Yeah. I know the community still has some concerns, and I know there's another meeting, and people are still talking about that, so I wouldn't say it's a... A done deal? I'm sure it probably will end up there. Oh, okay. And I always caution when that happens, that mm. the building now is opened up for a charter school to impact us again on the other one. Can I add one point sure, to that? Sure. And it, you have heard me say this, Mr. Manager, but it's I think what Tim just said is looking forward, not waiting until that building is vacant to figure out what to do with it, but having some thought ahead of time because 
I don't think any of us want to see another charter school in that, in that site. And I think that what we also don't want is us to leave and leave the neighborhood in a lurch. And I think there is probably a good <laughs> use for that building with some kind of housing situation yeah. that has low impact on the neighborhood yeah. that the city could <coughs> look to enter into a, an agreement with the, um, the parish there and be able to um, look at some kind of 99-year lease like the Smithsonian building up at, at St. Peter's Church. Right, right. Did you want to respond at all, Richard? No, I mean, just that, yeah, we, you know, I think once we know what the plan is here, that would be the next thing we would want to talk to them about. Well, so that's, we that's that actually where I was going. I mean, I, when I think about the money that we're spending on that facility, and because the facility needs so much work, that's why I say I'm happy to see mm -hmm. it go. But the other part of that was, you know, and Tim, you can talk more to what's going what's, what's going to be the end I result around the, charters. I, I don't know. The pastor to move them out ten years ago because they're operating at a loss. Mm -hmm. they, that could have been converted into like a CIC or mm -hmm. a potential. I know Charles Corral and me, They were looking for digital space. Mm -hmm. and they come in and they do everything. So right. he's lost money over the years. And mm -hmm. I told him ten years ago to move them out to mm -hmm. move to another location because it was a loss for them, and they've lost all that. But, I mean, so, but this is the reality now, and there's been some change there in the administrator, so I think <laughs> things will probably move along, but mm -hmm. I, all I just say is caution to the wind that be prepared for that space and to be, re could and I don't be reconverted disagree. very simply. But I think what David's saying is let's not wait until the no, building is like no, we're on the I'll doorstep of moving out, and then we're saying, I'll oh, say what do we do? So it's, a, it's on our, everyone's radar. <laughs> I mean, I think what Councilor Tony was saying a while ago, <laughs> you should all know this is not a done deal. This right. is the plan, right? right this so until it's a done deal, I don't want to start <coughs> kind of line of thinking on that other building because you still need that other building. Well, I, I, I want us to have the whole purpose of the conversation is so we can be proactive as opposed to reactive, you know, figuring out if, if, if that, if it does go forward and you'll let us know relatively, to, you know, as, as sure. soon in the process as possible, then we can know the council and the school committee what's the next steps. What do we do to not leave it for uh, a use that we may not favor? Uh, so that's what. Ms. Bowman, Nanika. I, I know this is not the time to go into a deep conversation around what we do with that building, but I um, would be remiss if I didn't say that I think it would be really important to see how we leverage it for our own school system. Mm -hmm. We are having these conversations about early childhood education, and if a building come online for us, that it, I, I feel like it's an opportunity to really move that conversation forward. So I did not want to miss the opportunity to say that. And it's important to say that because we could, uh, and, and Mark can attest, attest this, we have had numerous conversations around early childhood and early childhood center, which is still in the iCloud, I guess. You know, we have never been able to figure out a place to go. So I guess that you can hear, we really, if there's a way that we can continue to utilize it to the, that's, a, that's in a progressive, proactive, smart way for us to use it before it gets, goes back and gets used by someone else, we certainly. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a fair thing to say. Any reuse of that building is gonna require major renovations. That we know. That is not gonna be a simple building to deal with, particularly around the use of people and children and all. That would be very challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, the conversation is something we should have. Yes, thank you. Pat. I just want to add, I echo, I think all of our dream would be if that could be used for early ed, but also we don't own it. We don't know what limits there are on the archdiocese. It will be hugely expensive to renovate, but more importantly, I, where I sit, I do worry about the city, but it is a decade that we have subjected our administration oh, yeah. to completely unhealthy conditions mm -hmm. in that building. It is, I, I know you all share that. I'm just reminding us all why we're thrilled that we're finally thinking we thought it might be at the, what is now the Alice K. Wolf Center. I mean, we've been trying for a while. The school committee has passed what, when you were there, two or three resolutions that we don't want to sign another contract, but we can't leave them on the street. So <laughs> I'm thrilled. I'm hopeful that they will have new space if it could have been a renovated building there, but it, it is so unhealthy. It's, you know, I'm just worried about those paint chips falling down and, yeah. and Jeff and Jim and everybody here, we are yeah, like every day. I, I think we're all a little behind in terms of offering them a healthier space. Richard? Yeah, no, I, 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 Patty and Monique, I think they kind of, I mean, for me, I think 
you know, the 10 year old conversation, whatever happens after we get out of there, we can advocate or not for that. I'm not as concerned about that. I know that, and I wasn't always convinced this way that, um, you know, it's probably an act of treason that we have a staff in that building with, you know, there's little rooms, there's back trap doors. I mean, it's insane, quite frankly, that they're in there. So for me, I think we should um, move forward with the intention. I don't know what the holding should, should you know, could be, but but the intention of moving them out, mm -hmm. and then whatever happened. I mean, I'm you know, I I, I want to hear more about this right. charter school threat. I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it's new to me, but I'm sure it's there. But um, I think we should try to move forward and put our best foot forward to have this sort of new educational complex um, <coughs> serve us as we need mm -hmm. it to serve us. I'm much more concerned, however, with the enrollment trends and and, and you know sort of building out where where right. by the time we land there, it's already too small for the capacity. If <coughs> the trends mm -hmm. continue going, I'm much more concerned with that. And I think that Councilor Carlone's sort of questions about um, sort of North Point and <coughs> our wife are valid. I mean, I think in North Point, I mean, they may have enough people to have a new zip code, right? Absolutely. So I mean, it's a whole nother um, yeah. conundrum that, quite <coughs> frankly, it, you know. It, you know, we think 10 years out, there's a different issue. 12 years out, there's more issues. I think we should try to have, um, so that the folks can do their job, some kind of real focus on, in a real time, sort of um, forecast so that right, we can get this forecast, yeah. building done. I just would also note that, um, you know, to the, whoever mentioned about the usage, you know, we have a um, high school extension program that's mixed in with mm -hmm. another school. Mm -hmm. um, the Longfellow School, the old Longfellow, I guess, <laughs> We closed that 12 years ago, but that facility is going to be online at some point. So maybe this is a conversation about kind of the now in this project and, you know, next project out, but a longer, long-term facilities yeah. thing. Because if you think about the, the uh, Longfellow building as it sits, I mean, that's an interesting place to have a facility that will be online once we kind of figure out and move all the kids as a sort of um, swing space over the years of construction. Just some right. thoughts for the group. Right. Good point. Ms. Dexter, Emily, did you want to say anything? No, I just don't think about the long felt mentor of the long felt. It's the only neighborhood that doesn't have Okay, that's right. Well, I wanted to ask oh, Nadine, did you want to say you hadn't had it? I'm going to write this down. Give them time. Give them time. Get this warm it up. So, um, who will be here? Oh, okay. Fred? Oh, I, I was just going to say that in North Point, the sort of anchor tenant at the moment is EF Education, and then I hear that they are going to be building a third building there. So they will soon have three buildings in North Point and they're a global education company. So maybe there's something they'd like to do or help us do around mm. education. Build a school? <coughs> Work it, Freddie. Right, right. It's Ma Madam Mayor, I, yeah, I just on the, on, the, on the Archdiocese building, I just want to say that uh, you know, they, they treated the school system really well. Um, yeah. You know, in the midst of knowing, in the midst of knowing that that we were, the administration building was going to be moving, they renegotiated a three-year lease with us, and that was a perfect opportunity to really stick it to the school department in the city, and they chose not to. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, I think uh, they've proved to be a, a good partner with us, and I just want to make sure that that's my feeling. Mm -hmm. When's that lease up? Yeah. Jim, when's the lease? When's that lease up? Uh, the lease is up. We just renewed it for four years. Four years. I think it's up a year after 19. A, a year so after the Cambridge transition. Yeah. Yeah. So the school would be finished yes. before, before the, the lease, lease was up. Yes. Well, but it also, but it, it, it a lot. The reason we put an extra year in there was we don't, you know, the, so the goal I'm going to guess in the city is the construction, but we would want school first. So if there's any slips in there, we'll be on school. You know, just yeah, a curiosity. It wasn't a criticism at all. Just that that's probably smart thinking on our, on you, your part. It would take some time to be using all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Emily, no. I thought you said you had something about the long fill you wanted to ask. No, no, I'll raise your hand and ask the same question. Oh, okay. Can we go back to just for a moment, uh, Miss Kelly? Kathleen <coughs> has mentioned gender-neutral bathrooms going forward. So if we have this building finished, is there gender-neutral bathrooms? in it in the king on, king on the ml king junior so we have at, at any school at any given time uh, we have um, um, instances where we need gender uh, neutral bathrooms from 
but frankly, the very early grades onto the high school. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with the principals and the facility department to make sure that those accommodations are made so that the rights of the children are always respected. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so in other words, if I, when I say gender neutral bathroom, I guess I'm thinking about a bathroom that says lavatory and anyone can go in it. That's right. In a, in a accessible spot, not, you know, around the corner down the hall, but, you know, sort of in an accessible spot. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're saying, if you're saying is every bathroom gender neutral, the answer is no. No, no, I don't. But are there gender neutral? Yes. Is there a gender neutral bathroom that's gender neutral all the time, not swing space gender neutral, but truly gender neutral? Yes, yes, Carol's saying yes, yes, I'll, I'll go with yes. <laughs> She'll go with yes. Oh, I don't know about that. Okay, okay, <laughs> Kathleen. The idea is to create a space. I just want to add to what you were saying. To create a space that a transgender child or a transgender, transgender member of a child's family would feel safe using which means it is a, a neutral, right, right. neutral right. Yes. space. It's not identified in any way as a by gender. It's like what's that so let's connect so to go back. It's, right. It's like it's like the the. Um, <laughs> So I think like 344 Broadway. I, I look at those as gender yeah. neutral bathrooms. Right. Right. Doesn't you know? It doesn't. I don't know what it says actually, but I know it doesn't say male female. It says toilet. Toilet. Right. So you know, you, you get it. It's, you know, anyone can use it. And you know, we 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 are progressive. We're proactive. We said we're going to have it. But so if we're going to do that, we really have to do it in a way that, again, you don't have to go around the corner where there ain't no light to get to it. That's what I mean. Madam Mayor, can I just, it's to be completely supportive. Right, exactly. Uh, really quickly, Madam Mayor, though, can yeah. I just add something? So if our, you know, he's one of the smartest guys I know on the school side, but he doesn't really know, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But is there a way that we have these named so that the kids know? Because if, you know, Jim Maloney's saying, I, 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 then what is the fourth grader saying at the school? And, I, and I'm just being funny with Jim, but maybe some of this, and I know you mentioned 344, is about kind of how the new way of sort of naming the facilities or, you know, on the door so that people understand what, what's trying to be achieved. Right, it could be man, I was in it the could building. be lavatory, it could be right. water closet. But I was in the building and I didn't see this transgender I didn't need, that's why I'm asking. Well, it's called, it, makes, it wouldn't be called that. And right. the teachers yeah. all got, there was a training also that went in the process of the policy that we passed to uh, help teachers in terms of making sure that they said things in ways that would feel supportive of the students and their families. Mm -hmm. So the students know where those are. They We're know. guessing. We don't know that for, for, for a fact, right? We know it. For, I know it for a fact. Okay. So at the King, okay. come up. So at the King, I could call someone on Hay Street now that goes there, and they're going to say, I can say, you have a gender neutral bathroom. They're going to say, yes, we know it's a fact. I, I only caution you to say that, that I don't know that people are understanding this I at the think, level that we understand. I think I would say that I know the students and the families. Some of them. The, the students and the families who this is most, would be the greatest concern for. I'm trying to be very careful in my language, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. Would be aware of where those situations are. What I'm saying is that in order for this to really work, mm -hmm. forget about who's most sensitive to it. It has to be common knowledge amongst everybody to understand this. That's all I'm saying. And so maybe this is an issue of having reinforcing this on our side of the schools and then thinking forward about when we build new buildings on how we do this. I, I, I was in the building. I didn't know. And I'm a little over the fourth grade. And so we have to have a better understanding globally about how we should make sure that everybody knows this. That's all I would say. We can be more explicit. I mean, I, I've asked this question several times. We can be more explicit, mm -hmm. so it's more widely known and less of a guess. And, and we have to be intentional and deliberate about it as well. It's not even about being explicit. You know, if we're, if we're saying we have a policy and we have a procedure, we have a policy that we're going to have gender-neutral mm -hmm. bathrooms, then let's...
be very clear about it and mm -hmm. you don't have to look for it and figure exactly. it out and right. you know whisper behind someone's you should be if you're a transgender man or woman you should be able to feel comfortable right. to go into that facility right. you know and not worry about it and, and that's what's good about us we say we're going to do it so we just have to be better at doing it okay. Fair I was just going to say, I think, uh, so on this topic, I was just going to say, I don't know that you necessarily want, like, a, like this is your bathroom. Um, you know, I think it's, like, that does think a little bit stigmatizing, but, like, if you look at the way Google does their bathrooms, like, so they're all gender neutral, but they're all the same bathroom, and they have, in, like, they have doors on stalls that everyone's going into the same bathroom, but, it, you know, it's, there's no guy or girl doors. And it's, if you, it's at the... The new Google complex over the um, the parking structure, but yeah, this you know. a process question to you, Mayor. I, was, I guess on other things, when is the appropriate time to bring up other things that we'd like to talk about in the future? Or right. I mean, we're going to end this conversation shortly. We have a, another hour, and I was going to leave that other hour to just going of what what does this what do we as a joint elected body want to speak to? So we have about. Okay. Should I start on that? Or? Four more minutes. Well, let me oh, just no. I get, let me just say this, and if no one else wants, we can move on to the next topics so just um, to bring you guys back parking um, seems to be a, a, at least a nightmare at the King <laughs> School um, and but it sounds like you, you in in the case of the King open um, it looks like you've taken care of it I hope we're moving someplace around for taking care of it for the King School because that is a nightmare that doesn't seem to want to go away uh, particularly on McGee Street so I just, you know, as we go forward with the, all the schools, it sounds like you've taken care of it well, on the King Open with, you, with the still underground. It's a work in progress. Okay. We're trying to take care of it. I want to be clear. Okay, well, yeah. the, the, the yeah. King is there, yeah. and it, it's yeah. a, a debacle. Um, I just hope that we can, uh, people are just really angry. I'm sure some of you have gotten phone calls or emails about people's cars being hit or the bus is not being able to na navigate McGee Street. So. It's really something, when you talk about we've learned some things, I hope that we've learned that parking is is a huge thing. And the only other two things I would say about going forward to the King Open Building, I, I thought we had a wonderful open house at the ML King Junior School, but I, I think we could have been better at including the community. Um, we didn't, I don't think we acknowledged the community that was the histor from the historical perspective. I mean, I mentioned in my opening remarks, like talking about the Grahams and the, um, I can't even remember the names now. Richard, you can help me. The Phillips, the Right, Grahams, all those folks Dutton's that have been there that, you know, they're still, some of them are a little not, uh, not happy uh, um, about the school. That's an, some other stuff that we can talk about another time. I just want us to be respectful to the communities, just to remember who was there first or there before? Not first so much, but who was there before and how do we honor and pay attention uh, to that? I, I think it goes a long way with, build, with community building. I'm looking at you, Richard, but I mean for all of us. We just have to be more thoughtful about remembering that before was this brand new building that may have the administration building, may not, but it's gonna be this wonderful educational community complex. We remember the, the Valenti Library before it was new, and the Bocce Court that was there, and the, the Ola program, and before it was the Ola, and what was it, the Fitzgerald? Was it the Fitzgerald? No. What was Harrington. it? The Harrington. 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 The, you know, thank you, Sandra. Uh, you know, the, the Harrington School, it needs to be some testimony that. to that. You know, I think we can still capture that at the Ju El King Junior School, but just going forward, just there's got to be a way to remember or ag acknowledge that community. Um, the other thing was just the schools being a shared school and, and not belonging just to the school department. Um, going in and when it's finished that, you know, I know it's a brand new building and I want it and it's mine, it's my cafeteria, it's my gym and it's my this. And I just want us to make sure that the, sc the school is thought of as a shared facility and not just a school facility. You know, I, I know we've had a couple of, someone stopped me and saying they felt like they couldn't get into the, the new building. And so going forward, that's something I certainly want to um, pay attention to. And then just the last thing is, and this is, I guess, a, a, a Jim Maloney or a Claire Spinner question, is are, are you watching, are socioeconomics beginning to change? Do you see a marked change 
and the socioeconomics of our students? So there's been, <coughs> the question of the changing socioeconomics, there's been a, a slight drift um, towards more full pay. Um, not huge. Uh, we're, uh, one of the factors that addresses that change is the new policy. The kindergarten assignment numbers used to be um, the K to eight uh, socioeconomic status um, uh, ratios plus or minus 10%. Mm -hmm. um, now it's um, K to five um, enrollment plus or minus 10% with a weighted based upon um, the past few years. So mm -hmm. it, at the low, at the K to five level this year, I think the, um, for the lottery we just ran, the uh, socioeconomic status, the high end uh, for full pay, I believe, can be 72%, mm -hmm. uh, which is significantly about 7% higher than what it's been uh, historically. No. That's the result of two factors. First, the change in the demographics. Not huge. I mean, there, Cambridge has certain, <coughs> I think because of your uh, affordable housing programs in Cambridge, there is a certain um, Blue almost that helps protect that from going too low, um, but on the other end, as as more people are entering the school uh, or full pay, there's not there's not a, a limit on that. So yeah. the ratios can change. Yeah. Uh, it's not a significant one in my opinion, but it's it's growing. It's trending. <coughs> something to watch. More full right. pay. Mm -hmm. Jim, isn't it the last three years of Uh Well, you point it. it I can't. I didn't hear you. Yes. What, what did you ask him? The last three years. Yeah. But so the bottom line is the K through five are are in in a gradual trend towards um, full pay. Full pay. So, and the lottery is actually done on the last three years of kindergarten only, mm -hmm. with the idea that that more accurately reflects the kindergarten enrollment, not. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, I think also to this point, again, if I miss this, if you look at our K, the the the, the K to five. Balancing is considerably easier right now because of the it's, it's limited at K to five. Um, the drift that you would see in the upper grades in a K to eight system has pretty much disappeared. There's some some issues in the six to eight program that I think we need to pay attention to mm -hmm. uh, as a district. But in the K through five, there the balancing has become easier. That that trending towards certain um, K through eight schools that became higher pay mm -hmm. in the middle school years <coughs> has disappeared, although there's some signs that, there, that it may be an issue in the 6 to 8 uh, in the future. Okay. Mark? Um, I just, you know, when we think about those numbers and paid lunch and free and reduced lunch, let's, let's remember that the way we determine who is paid lunch and who is free and reduced lunch is with the federal guidelines for poverty, which are absolutely ridiculous for Cambridge. So right. if you're a family of four that makes $24,000 a year, you're not considered in poverty. And you know the group that we led said that you need to make $108,000 a year for a family of four to pay all their bills every month in Cambridge. So you know, I think right. when we think about, when we say paid lunch, it conjures up these images of sort of wealthy families that the reality is is that the families that are free lunch are basically all public housing families. If you can afford rent in this city, you're not qualifying. <laughs> For free and right. reduced lunch in Cambridge, but that and doesn't that mean doesn't mean rich. that you're that doesn't right. mean that your family's making two hundred thousand dollars a year and can afford to give you all the things that we think you can. So there's right. a real there's a huge gap between who is financially stable enough to do all the things yes. we think paid lunch families can do mm -hmm. and free and reduced lunch. And there's a lot of families that fall through that crack. I, I just I just raise it because as as the city council yeah. side looks at the housing our housing policies and what we're trying to do around housing, we might want to do that with an eye toward trying to preserve our economic diversity as much as possible, and we have some control over that at, through our housing policies. Does someone over here want to say something? So why don't we put more kids on reduced lunch? We can't just put them. Well, <laughs> one of the recommendations from one of the recommendations from the committee, from the Income and Security Committee, was to look at using keeping the you know for the school to you know if they want to keep the school department wants to keep the free and the federal guidelines to determine Certain placement things. school mm -hmm. placement that's one thing but in terms of free and reduced lunch personally i would love us to use a more accurate figure to cambridge that's money and the question is do we want to invest that money in it but mm -hmm. we have a lot of families that do not qualify for free and reduced lunch but cannot afford forget healthy but cannot afford to give their kids 
breakfast and lunch every day. And although we never deny, the schools never deny anybody lunch, we do spend, and I'd be curious to this, the administrative cost of chasing families that owe $400 or $500 because their kid gets free lunch every day because they don't have the money but they don't qualify for it. We spend time and energy and we make people feel terrible because we chase them for 400 bucks that they don't have mm -hmm. when we could just give the kids free lunch what they're doing anyway and absorb the cost somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's my own little so, soapbox. So just quiet. why don't we use your numbers of the federal number and how much would it cost if we, if we did that? I don't know you that why. easy, but go ahead, Richard. So I think from, from running the school district, we, we are bound to this kind of federal criteria for other things. It sets up our Title I. It, it just sets up a lot of things. So that was a safe criteria, particularly uh, particularly as it pertains to um, being clean at least legal. So, you know, I don't think we have the, the, the leeway to say, okay, we could what you could do, lunch. what what you could do is, and we could like, just give talk, them the lunch. But we, right. we I did, I, I, I talked to them about this. What we could do when you fill out your free and reduced lunch form, you yeah, have to other. put down what your income is. So, it's an extra step. But when the school is getting those forms, the school could say, okay, this person is considered a free lunch student because by the federal by the federal, federal guidelines. So, they, so they're going to be placed here or there, but their income is below. You, you could you could do both things because you have the information. You could still use the federal guide. Everyone has to fill out that form anyway. Yeah. You could still use that form to determine school placement, but by looking at what the person's income is on that form, you could also then say this person's going to get free lunch. You'd have to maybe change up some of the terms. But um, I didn't want to go there, but I just did, I wanted to say about the dem demographics. We have a lot of people, a lot of kids in the city that are considered to be their families money, are considered to be financially stable, and they're mm -hmm. far from it. Well, right. So, mm -hmm. can I just follow up? You, you get a less word. So, so, mm -hmm. so, why don't we, why don't we do that, and how much would that? Because I think this is, this is a, you know, we're all together and talking pre-budget, mm -hmm. but how we'll much talk would that cost? Seven hundred grand, I think so, we talked about. I mean, it, there's, I think it's important to first of all recognize what we do already. Yeah. Um, right now, uh, Cambridge, unlike a great many communities in Massachusetts, subsidizes our lunch program to the tune of almost $900,000 a year. In most districts in the state, or in great many of them, um, school lunches are paid entirely by federal receipts for those who can't pay or pay a reduced number, and the, the, uh, those that can pay. Mm -hmm. In Cambridge, for a variety of reasons, um, not the least of which is we have, um, I think, a very broad, healthy menu system um, that includes various types of ethnic food, uh, vegan <coughs> selections, um, vegetarian, um, <coughs> it's a very, it's, it's not, there are, it's not my mother's. I was going to say, it's not a lot of chicken pucks being uh, served. So I think it's important to remember that. And second of all, for us to go to a universal free lunch is probably between a uh, half a million and $700,000 a year. So we, we don't, in we addition. don't spend additional, in addition. And we don't, I have to say, we don't, well spend, we don't spend a lot of time yes. chasing people. Um, we could reduce staff, we have cashiers, we, we could do away with cashiers, et cetera. Um, in, in schools that would have an offsetting savings um, if we spent that money. Um, but it's relatively small. Jim, no one's going to bring that motion in. You know. yeah, we'll <laughs> no one's going to bring that motion in. We don't want to get rid of the cashiers. We'll That's right. We'll do something else. But. Fred will get rid of it. Yeah. So, okay. But I, I, you know, we've had, we've had some of these conversations right. already. So, so it, thank it, you for that report. And, and you know, some of the, what came back from that is to hear back from you and maybe this kind of format where we are with the schools going forward, particularly as um, as it pertains to will the administration be able to um, occupy the Cambridge Street building or not. Okay, so we move to the second part of the agenda and, and um, we have another hour. You don't have to feel compelled to stay for that. No, you do have to feel compelled to stay, but we don't have to talk uh, ourselves to that hour. But I wanted to, to give ourselves an opportunity to just talk about our shared agenda and what we want to discuss over the next several months. The City Council recently amended its rules to allow for, I think, six, four, three, more? Three more. Three. More, yeah. No, I don't think Total it's three four. more. Yeah. I think Total we'll, four. Okay. More opportunities for the school committee and the City Council to meet. And, the, and the school committee already has three on 
in, in their in their roles. And so how do we best use these opportunities to talk about our, our shared, shared agendas? I mean, we, we each, I thank each of you for signing up to serve uh, the citizens, whether we're on the school committee or on the city council, and we do have shared uh, areas. And so how do we, and what do we want to spend our um, workshop roundtable time talking on and working through, again, our collaboration is something that we owe to the residents and the constituents of our city. So when I went down my list of, of I, I, put, I think you have it, the list of what I thought were some of the shared areas, I mean the budget, early childhood education, universal pre-K, charter schools and charter, you know, we just spent almost 15 minutes of uh, school committee, city council meeting talking about charter schools. Um, STEAM, STEM, mitigation funds, how it affects our schools, cultural proficiency, school climate, family engagement, after school programs slash community schools, school facilities, world language instruction, poverty and homelessness, office of college success, internet threats, swatting, indigenous people days, just to, some of the things that I came up with. Um, I don't know if there's other things that you want to put on this list, but this is our opportunity to think through or give me and um, the vice mayor and vice chair some direction around what we want to talk to in this roundtable setting. Councilor Chung, Ms. Bowman, <coughs> Ms. Nolan. Well, uh, so now I want to add, talk about adding 700000 to the meal budget to add to the 900000 just to do <laughs> universal lunch. Um, I'd be open to that going forward. I would love to, going forward, talk about uh, uh, universal pre k and early childhood education. I think so that was quite, oh, I was just giving my list of what. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to write it down, okay. so um, the way to begin to get it. I've been expressed by frustration pretty vocally about, you know, the, the pace of which things are proceeding, although I, I like the ideas that, that are coming out of the, uh, the task force and the plan going forward, but, you know, we already do pre-K and very well between Special Start and Fletcher Maynard and the Tobin School. I think this city already knows how to deliver a really quality, high quality pre-K education. I just like to Let's just blow it out and let's double down on that. Um, I think uh, STEM and STEAM is an ongoing conversation. Other people will probably talk about some more. Uh, I also am very interested in world language, um, having an update just for what's going on with the you know, Chinese especially, but um, thinking about how can we continue to expand language opportunities um, across the district and across <coughs> grades. And then very interested recently with all the news about internet threats and swatting and the idea that someone in India can just email in a bomb threat and we have to just mobilize and respond, just um, I don't know how we how we cope in that kind of uh, reality. So those are things that just top of mind for me. Thank you. Okay. Floor's open. Ms. Oh, I do have a batting over, uh, order. Ms. Bowman and then Ms. Nolan. I would like to add to the conversation of workforce housing because we have tons of educators that cannot afford to live in our city. We know that housing is a huge issue, but I would like to have the conversation from the perspective of our teachers. And so I would like to have that added to the conversation and the agenda. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think all of these issues are uh, worthy, appropriate. They're all important. However, I don't. I. I don't think. Obviously, as you said, we'd get through all of them in depth. So I put the three top that I think are the most appropriate for the joint body, mm -hmm. um, early childhood education, universal pre-K, and I see that very much as a mix. While we do some things well, I feel like the city and the existing child care providers in the city already do such a great job and in some ways, frankly, better than the school department. I would really want this to be joint, not all thrust on the school department. Also, frankly, I feel like we have so much on our plate already. I don't want this to be, well, you guys fix it. You're already in education. You do all the pre-K and preschool because I feel like, you know, we still have to frankly work for our middle schools to be better because that's where we're, we continue to lose, lose people. But I think it's a key, key issue. Mm -hmm. The second is on this after school program in community schools. Mm -hmm. Again, that's something that is already a blend. It's totally appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and family engagement. Um, again, those are, are the ones I see of that list that are most amenable to a joint workforce from the two bodies to work together. I, I would never not want to address family engagement. I didn't get it. Oh, say something for family no, engagement. No, before it. Oh, it, after school programs in community schools. So that after school space, the um, out of school time, uh, mm -hmm. which I would probably broaden that to be not just after school, but maybe out of school time, mm -hmm. okay. which includes the summer. Sure. And, and I think for instance, poverty, homeless. I think they should be part of every one of those conversations, mm -hmm. so that it, you know that 
that yeah. affects early childhood, that mm -hmm. affects after school, that affects family engagement. So, but, but in terms of the top three on your list, those are ones that I popped out to me as the most urgent for us to address as a joint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to suggest uh, two topics, uh, one of which uh, Ms. Nolan just touched on a little bit, and if I expand on that and then add one other one that I talked to, a couple of them is the school committee about, but starting with the first one, around the out of school time, you know, there's a, um, there's a pretty interesting growing body of social science research right now around the idea of collective impact. And anyone can look this up. All you can do is search collective impact. And I know that, um, I forget the guy's name who came to that, uh, that workshop that we providers oh, were there right. and they were yes. the guest speaker and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I don't remember his name. I, I don't yeah. remember his name. Either. But collective impact is really something that Cambridge is sort of on the verge of, but not all the way there. Collective impact really speaks to the idea of being really intentional and methodical about ways in which schools and municipal agencies uh, collaborate to um, attend to the needs of kids. And uh, you know sometimes well I've often said the interesting thing about, about OST, out of school time, is that in schools we have the kids for six hours a day. And if we assume just for the sake of keeping the math easy, even though I think it's not true, <coughs> that they sleep for eight hours a day, that's 14. That leaves 10 hours a day of whatever. And while well, I don't think that 10 hours a day need to be rigorously scheduled, I think there's a lot to be said for free time and having fun and the rest of it. Um, there is something to be said about being even more methodical and intentional around um, the kinds of opportunities that we can plan and the ways in which the city and the schools can collaborate. And collective impact, as, a, as I say, as a research item, um, offers us a pretty interesting framework to approach that. So I just want to put that out there to second what's on here already. Mm -hmm. The other one that's not really explicitly mentioned on here, although facilities might incorporate it, something that the manager uh, kind of alluded to at the very beginning, which is around safety and security. So we've had some difficult times here in the last year or so around safety and security. And I think there is a capital element to this, and you just referred to that, Ms. Uh, Rossi, around, um, you know, whether it's around the use of uh, cameras, whether it's around the use of mm -hmm. swipe cards, or locking doors, or, you know, all the kind of stuff associated with safety and security. And there's an obviously a very important role for our city partners here, particularly the police department, but not <coughs> limited to the police department in ways in which we can best use our SROs or other mm -hmm. um, individuals to um, support our work. Even though I think in the crisis moments, um, I'm thinking back to some of those uh, phone calls with when I was talking to you at two in the morning, yeah. right? With, uh, with you, Ellen, and uh, Bob Haas, and Jim Maloney, and others when we were having all of those bomb threats, but I think stepping back and thinking about safety and security is a very powerful and important issue for the city to take on, and it's one in which the natural tendency for cities and schools to collaborate is right there in front of us. Um, there are challenges with this, right, which have to do with the cultural challenge, where um, I know Jim has spoken about this, which I think is going to be the hardest part of it. It's pretty easy to go out and buy the, I mean, if the money's there, go out and buy the key swipes. Uh, what's harder is to try to uh, educate folks around um, what kind of school, what kind of buildings do we want our schools to be? Should they be the warm, open, nurturing environments that people are free to come and go as they please and feel like it's part of one big happy family? That's on one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum is should they be fortresses, right? Where Everyone needs a key or an ID or you know, a thumbprint or whatever to, to enter, and there's a police officer. Well, probably we don't want either of those extremes, but wherever we sit in the middle seems to me to be a very, very important, um, important uh, discussion to be had, because all it takes for one terrible <coughs> thing to happen, and we'll regret not having had this, uh, this plan in place. Okay, thank you. Others? I just wanted to add to this, when I look at this, what's happening in our school system. And I, if we're going to convene as a joint body to, between the two, I really think we have to elevate the conversation mm -hmm. a bit to how are we developing a city 
in a way that keep that that creates an intersectionality between these two bodies that allows us to benefit benefit each other. So case in point, we started a conversation earlier today about North Point and LY. Mm -hmm. So if we can start thinking about planning in the concept of a community and approach, which includes, of course, more development, but what does development look like? There's a private sector aspect to it, but there's a public sector aspect to it. And start thinking that way, I think it would, I think that would be a more beneficial way to <coughs> approach these two bodies coming together. Because right now, this feels like just a list of the things that we discuss as a body on the school committee side, but there has to be a, a, a joint approach. Right. Actually, this sort of some of the things that either one, either one or the other <coughs> body does or is impacted by. This is my list; I will own it. But it was something to give us something to start thinking from, as opposed to giving you a, a blank slate. So this is not an, this is Denise's list. I <laughs> throw it out there; you can throw it away and start anew. But it was just something to get the brain percolating. So thank you. But I just want to make sure I don't. I'm not locked into any of this, but I wanted us to kind of think about what was there. Um, Richie. So three you, Madam Chair, I think this is exactly what the citywide planning is about. Exactly. And I really urge yeah. the schools to be, you know, really involved in that planning process. And you know, whether it's a school committee member or a couple of them, or members of the administration who need to be focused in on bringing that school story forward mm -hmm. all the time. I think it's really important. And I think that's how we're gonna get the better conversation. Mm -hmm. All those things can be discussed. Dennis, then Mark, and then Patty. Uh, I was just going to say the Sorry. same thing. The vision plan <laughs> opens the door. <laughs> no, no, you did great. You did. I love hearing it, Rich. Uh, I was reading your notes. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Still doing that. Fred, what do you want me to write down next? Uh, but I, I appreciate the comment because that's what we're all about is building community. We might, our emphases might be in different places during the day, but at night it's all that. It's all where how people come together. And, um, well, I could talk a lot about this, but I won't given the amount of time that's left. But I, I totally agree. The opportunities are huge. But every huge. urban design plan that the city has has to focus on community. And the successes, like uh, at least what I saw the first time going through the MLK school, uh, it felt like community. And you don't always see that in public buildings these days. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just say, just real quickly on, on that, I mean, I would, I would suggest that the consultants meet specifically with the with folks from the schools in a separate, I mean, they should go to the public meetings as well, but public meetings are often, the public is there, they wanna speak, we try to not dominate that conversation, but I think let's make, sh you know, let's make sure that there's a special yeah. opportunity. And, um, and to what, you know, what Monika said, I mean, I certainly don't wanna speak for the school committee, but, you know, having done both, these kind of round tables always felt for, to me when I was on the school committee that it was very, heavy on what did the city council want to know from the schools and what was the critique of the schools from the city council where I think you're right where there has to be some way where the, the decisions that we make on the council about affordable housing impact what happened on the schools and so the 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 topics really have to be balanced and I wonder what but we don't have to all we don't have to talk about everything in a round table so I wonder what what other ways we can share information about what is I mean we can certainly I could go to a school committee meeting and, and go to those meetings as well and sit in the audience and you guys can come every Monday night, but short of that, because we all, that's unrealistic. Um, what are some that other ways that we can, what are some other ways we can share information back and forth between what's, what are the initiatives with the schools and what are the initiatives or the topics being discussed from the city that doesn't take a formal round table to have that conversation? Because some of it is just, I just want an update, you know, what's going on with, you know, I mean, you could take it, you know, what What are you guys doing about school climate? That doesn't have to be a, sure, I have my thoughts, but that's your stuff, right? And we have to also trust each other to deal with staying in our lanes a little bit. But what, what are some other ways we can exchange information that isn't a formal meeting? So we're just not gonna have enough time to touch on everything. 
And, and that's a good point. I mean, and I'm interested in hearing people's thoughts. I mean, we always we have we are a little we are bound in some way by the open meeting law and, and quorum, and so you have to keep it in that context. But there are workshops, there's retreats, there's a few other uh, kinds of ways, and I'm interested if people know about the ways that we can sort of get together informally or formally. I'm open to that. The idea is trying to build a collegial relationship so we're, we're asking and exchanging information from both parties. At the end of the day, it's all our city. Uh, Richard and then yeah. Fred. So I, I think um, some of the stuff, Madam Mayor, your list wasn't that bad. I just want to let you know that. It Thank you, Richard. <laughs> just, just to be clear, here, you, did cover, you did cover a few things. I know that they're you're kind of... Uh, Shoot the messenger. Exactly. You'll take some shots over Despite there. what Monika thinks, the list was pretty good. <laughs> So I had nothing to do with it. Except, uh, and I think you did. It was Fred's list. Right, right. I think you did do uh, um, a, a good job. You covered a lot, and I think it's probably things that you've heard in your kind of in your space. So um, some of the stuff um, is on there, particularly the easy ones, I think, which are early childhood, um, the STEM stuff. Although I have to say, in the last two years, I really don't know what was really done on the city side. So we should think about how we re-engage. And that on. is a question. Where is STEAM and STEM? I don't know. Right. I just put they're, it on the They're desk. somewhere in the atmosphere, probably close <laughs> to Kendall Square, I'm sure. But, mm -hmm. but the truth is, you know, I don't know exactly where we are on either side. So it's sort of re-engaging that conversation that was on your list. Mm -hmm. I would add just a couple other things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think what Monique was talking about was really thinking about this from the perspective of complete cities, which, as uh, Councilor Calone said, you know, you're always, every, every turn you're thinking about the community and how everything affects, um, with the, you know, sort of the pros and cons of each of the policies and things that happen on the other side of the aisle. Um, I think that, you know, being a little broader um, around some of those issues like employment and employability, mm -hmm. which kind of links to Office of College Success and other things, um, and even some of our young people who don't do fare so well after they leave um, this, uh, building and other, um, you know, the charter schools in the city and even coming back from the community colleges. I think the affordable housing issue is one we've always dealt mm -hmm. with, whether it be for the professionals and just the families who are being squeezed out even though um, we're doing our best job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not always um, the case where they can live in some of these new places, whether it's the lottery or other things. I think it just poses a mm -hmm. threat in some ways to our families or at least the traditional families that we know. and. I, I don't want to um, indict the new people that move in, for however they land here, but there's definitely a group of folks that are in our schools that are, you know, they feel that they're being threatened, quite frankly, by the climate in the mm -hmm. city around the affordability mm -hmm. um, and how their, their economic security is or not in this time as we move forward. Um, I think, for me, two big things that we should try to inject into the conversation are mental health and sort of trauma, that stuff. <laughs> Um, I'm seeing it a lot from my public health lens um, that, you know, this is a big deal, whether it be the parents or, or even children, just mm -hmm. the whole um, group of individuals that are in the margins around this particular issue. Um, the opioid crisis, which mm -hmm. I think um, affects us down the line, and we've buried some of our sort of graduates or alum from this school, um, and we're doing it much too frequently for my stomach and I'm sure yours, but I think injecting that into the conversation so we can figure out how we can do a better job at um, keeping it on the radar, thinking about where the intersection between the school and that population as people mature through our system, um, you know, getting people help. I can tell you in the pro one of the programs I run that some of the council that's seen, I know Ms. Devereaux was at our graduation <laughs> last week, there are a lot of kids who their issues start when they're, quite frankly, in the high school. You know, they have a hockey injury and they're on pills and you know, four years later, they become this statistic that we read about that we, you know, that kid was, you know, I remember him as a great goalie, a great football player, whatever it is. Those problems aren't starting when those kids are 22, 23, 24, 25, by and large. You have this group that, you know, for whatever reason, no one's fault, they just get caught up a little earlier and they end up um, mm -hmm. on our sort of radar when maybe it's too late or later than we would expect. So I think those are two issues we should try to figure out. I don't know how we would incorporate it into the conversation, but if you're asking, those would be two of mine. Then I think the sort of bigger ones that, we ch that have challenged us for years, the race and class issues, and mm -hmm. the, even the culture. I mean, you know, that stuff is, is still real and relevant um, in our city. I think that um, oftentimes we try to do the right thing, but we don't necessarily land there every time. And 
you know, one of the things that was unfortunate about, in my opinion, this last election cycle is that these things were coming out in different spaces. And I think that uh, many people talked a lot about this stuff in many different sort of silos, but I don't know we've had that conversation amongst the leaders. And I think if we're going to lead, we have to force that conversation in some ways and understand that it's going to be difficult and understand that it's going to be necessary. Um, and then the last thing I think, which really is kind of what I thought we'd be trying to do, is think about the relationship of the two bodies and how we're going to coexist and work, um, particularly in this moment where these two fearless gentlemen are leaving, Mr. Rossi and, uh -huh. and our superintendent, because you know while they shared a good relationship, there's no guarantee, unless Ms. Peterson is going to be the person on the other side, that we're going to have leaders who think like and cooperate like these two gentlemen have over the last couple of years. And I think that's important because, you know, when you move at the pace that our city moves, you have to have these decision makers understanding each other's, um, what they need to be successful and how mm -hmm. to make sure that their bodies respectively that um, they're speaking to, in Mr. Rossi's case, the city council, and the superintendent's case, the school committee, how they can have um, that collegial, respectful relationship where um, you, you, you think about, as Mr. Uh, Carlon said and Manika said, that you're thinking about the whole city all the time when you're engaging in these very high level <coughs> conversations. And if that respect and relationship isn't there, mm -hmm. and you know, Lord knows what an international search brings you. I mean, in Cambridge, you can get an international search and you can find the person that lives three doors down. I mean, that's just how it works sometimes. So we don't know what we're going to get on your side. We know we have a new incoming superintendent who I'd like to protect to some degree when they when he engages with the whoever the new people on the city side are. But I think that's important to think about the relationship both of the electeds across the aisle and then of the sort of CEOs who run the, mm -hmm. the ships uh, respectively. Thank you. Thank I you. heard they just arm wrestle. <laughs> I've seen Kenny Salim's arms. I don't know. We might be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> shut up, shut up. Okay. So we get Fred, Emily, Kathleen, David. I just want to say to Mr. Harding, I know that Richie and, and, uh, and Jeff believe him, but I'm staying, Mr. Harding. So if you gives you any solace. <laughs> oh. I'll sleep in an hour. Thank you. You won't lose a wink, Fred. You won't lose a wink. <laughs> so my, uh, I'll just, uh, I think the joint committee idea that we both work together is a great idea, and we should pursue that. And I'll just mention two things. The Office of College Success, I've been really pleased with its, how it's unfolding, and I think that's important that we need to work together on that and make it more public. Um, the most, I think the most of us know the most important measurement we can have is when our kids are out of high school for six years, are they succeeding and graduating from college and going into a career? I mean, that's, that's the final ultimate measure of how successful the school system is. So I think we need, to, we need to work on that. We need to make that more public. And I think, quite honestly, you know, um, I, I actually believe that a lot of kids don't finish college for as small of reasons as that, that they can't afford a bus pass. I think it's as small as that that can, that can make the difference for a first time uh, student going, uh, a college going student uh, can't, can't continue his college education. And so, you know, when you think of it, on June 10th when I graduate from high school and then after receiving all kinds of support, all kinds of care, and that just all comes to an end abruptly. You know, and so we as a city, you know, I know, you know we as a city need to, be more, need to be, do more about that and to, and, to, and to help these kids along. I mean, if you go to, if you go to uh, Bunker Hill Community College and you take two remediation courses, you pay for those courses. So your Pell Grant runs out, you've got to pay for those uh, other courses. You don't have the money to pay for those courses. So there are a thousand ways. If your car breaks down and you can't go to college and you've never had anyone go to college before, you just, you just don't go. If you get a college award letter that says you've got a full boat scholarship and you've got to respond by August 13th and you've never read one of those before, you lose the full boat scholarship, which has happened in our school system. So this is the stuff that we have to work together and put to an end and really hit a home run on this. And I think that, I, I think that, I think the, the elements are in place to be very successful at this. And so I think this is a perfect place to do it. And then the second one is the after school programs and the community schools. As the after school programs relate to the middle school programs, I think we've made progress on both ends. I'd like us to just re-engage in that from the standpoint of we have a six hour day, we probably need to, you know, the way that we need to extend that day is through things like after school programs. And so whether that's world languages, whether that's, um, you know, so, so, many, so many other things that we can do in after school programs, 
And I'd really like to see the after school program for those teachers that work for the city side, that that be a pathway for those people to become teachers in our system. I think we need to marry those two elements in a way that uh, is going to guarantee success for, for our schools. So, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think the emotional, uh, you know, the social and emotional issues, I think the after school program can add great, great, uh, great strength to that. So those are just two, two ideas. Thanks, Ray. Emily? Um, two issues. One is attendance and absences issue. This probably goes along with poverty and homelessness and mental health and all the other things. But there are uh, some kids who are missing several weeks of school every year. Um, Ellen and I have spoken about that once or twice. And the other one is civics education and civics engagement. Um, even something as simple as making sure every child in U.S. history goes to a city council meeting or some way to connect what's happening in the schools with what's happening. We want to encourage them, Emily. We want to encourage them. You don't want to? We want to. That's what I mean. Okay. Because <laughs> people have some debt. All these things, because we're developing leaders, not just workers, not just college students. Thank you. Kathleen. So um, for me, I think it's really looking at how we do the zero through college for all our students and all our families. And so it's all the different ways that the PD programs intersect with the schools. And then having those programs reinforce each other and some of the softer subjects, I think, that we talked about here with the family engagement, with the cultural proficiency, with the school climate, that we're in the same place in the city programs that we are in the school programs. So that it develops those relationships um, and extends them because at times the out of um, the out of school time programs actually have a closer relationship for many of the families right. than the schools do. So mm -hmm. how can they help us connect the families then with the schools for things that um, I think about looking at. Um, <coughs> and, um, so that's, those are primary issues for me. The other issue for me is um, when we're talking about housing in the city, the way that that um, influences um, our control choice program. <coughs> and a big question for me has always been, what is the housing policy in the city? And we have a policy around control choice. Mm -hmm. And are they working together, or are they working at cross purposes? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> David? You know, I. I, I think sometimes I think that we just have to almost um, pause a little bit and make sure that we're working with current information. Having been on both bodies and having cheered uh, both bodies, I think a lot of times, and, it's, and I'm not saying this is an insult to folks, but I think, I think there are people that think they have the information, and a lot of times the information that they have is old information. So sometimes I think you have to almost pause and kind of catch people up in a way. And I think, it, and when I, you know, I'm just thinking about the school department in a, in a way, some of the issues, you know, the level two schools, the level three schools, and kind of talking. I'm not sure everybody is on the same page and understands the where we were, where we are type of situation. Um, I think the challenges around security are a big issue. I think what you just said about about the housing issue, I think the committee, I think the council has talked a lot about who is going into apartments and who is it serving. And then when Monique had talked about kind of the workforce, we kind of have that. It, it, we, we don't have it for families necessarily, but for <coughs> a young teacher coming into the system, quite honestly, they could probably get an apartment in Cambridge with a two or three month wait right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that you folks know that, what we know. So sometimes the information's floating around. We think you know it, and you think we know it. And I don't think people really are necessarily on the same page. Mm -hmm. And it may mean just kind of taking a year in review once in a while, and just kind of going through um, and not feeling embarrassed that we don't might not know the facts in a way, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, Fred talked about the whole issue of, of uh, and it's an emerging issue. It's an issue that, on the right. school department side, 
more and more uh, attention is, is given to it, but the whole issue of social emotional uh, issues facing teachers today, facing mm -hmm. kids today, and, and we are fooling ourselves if we don't think that that goes right into Ellen's area and it goes into the playing fields and it goes into every single aspect of a child's life and a family's life. So I, I think there are lots of, of um, and, and I also think that the issue that you talked about, um, I think it was the superintendent that talked about the, the whole issue of security and how that weighs on families um, and how it weighs on kids. And, and we think we're communicating sometimes, maybe we're not doing it in the best way. But so I, I almost think before you can tackle the list, I almost think you have to catch people up where we are currently. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have um, Craig, then Richie. I'll come right around. Craig, Richie, Nadine. Thanks, everyone, for coming. This is a real brain dump. I would suggest that the mayor periodically hosts social events, the forum at the office with coffee, donuts, bagels, whatever, with an expectation that over time we'll build the personal relationships that I think would help us have a better professional relationship. Thank you, Craig. Richie. I was going to say that I think this is one of the You was going to say you're going to pay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the bagels, sure. <laughs> it might be day old, but this is one of the best discussions that I have sat through between the school committee and the city council in a long time. And I think going to where David was going and what Denise is trying to do here is to say, these are the issues that are before us, right? It's tough to come to a meeting and debate. We have to have this. No, we don't. Yes, we do. This should be first. I think understanding all the issues and then almost going through a prioritization of what are the most important ones, what are the realistic ones that we can tackle. I think, you know, from the administration of the city to the administration of the schools, we have great pairing. Al Ellen and, and uh, Carolyn have worked together for years. Uh, Louie and Jimmy and Claire and Lisa and, and Gina have worked together for years. They have great respect for each other. I think the message that all of you send, not only to us but to the community, about this is how we're going to move forward is such an important one. These are tough issues. These don't get solved in one two-hour meeting once a quarter. These are really tough issues. Figuring out what information we need to get, what's the priority, and let's tackle them one at a time, I think is, is the way to go. I think I'm, I'm really impressed with tonight. I think this is a good thing. Thank you. Nadine. Thanks, Mayor Simmons. So I, I want to echo some of the other issues others have brought up and, and just maybe put a slightly different uh, perspective on some of them. Uh, I think the most, maybe the prime and most important thing that um, uh, Richard Harding brought up is the, the race class issue. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just really blatantly obvious in, in today's America and, and especially here in, in Cambridge that if you're of a certain class, you really just aren't going to have the same opportunities. It's, it's very direct correlation. It's something we've got to be talking about a certain percentage of the time, I feel, both in council and in in, in school committee, and I'm sure you already do on school committee, but um, but there, there's ways to attack this problem that have been undertaken throughout the world. There, these are known issues, and equity projects often relate to things that are already on the list, like family engagement and out of school time and, and that type of thing. And I think to the extent that we actually have maybe a medium to longer term program, a five or 10 year plan, um, we may be able to actually um, I know we already seek to mitigate these things, but it's a losing battle so far, to be totally honest. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, as I think about the future of education um, on a 20-year time scale or 10-year time scale, it will, will education exist in buildings, in infrastructure, with the same expenditures in the same way in 10 years? Maybe. Will it exist in the same way in 20 years? Definitely not. And, and so if there's some kind, that's 10, that's 10 re-election cycles, right? That's, that's, we can feel how long that is. It's not that long, it goes quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how, how do we actually imagine as a group how we ought to budget, how we ought to plan, how we ought to invest for the longer term? And it's, it's totally 
unreasonable to be making large-scale bonded out investments today that last for 30 years. <coughs> but will it be as reasonable four years from now? I'm not sure. Um, uh, real engagement for me, uh, as I said, underlies a lot of a lot of these things. Real engagement is hard. Real engagement is really hard. Um, I don't think it's something that any of us have probably perfected. And there may be some some glints of hope around the table, but. But problem solving and debugging how real engagement happens and, and how the most the families in most need of um, of that engagement and of, of a helping hand um, until there's more traction. I think that that'll that'll be the panacea for a lot of these other problems. <coughs> and then lastly, uh, budget. I just think in general a, a zero based budgeting approach where you start from from scratch every however long maybe it's every ten years maybe it's every twenty years maybe it's every five years. But, but to do incremental budgeting often leaves decision makers like us without the latitude we need to really plan in the long term. And, and I don't know when it is <laughs> that this collective body will want to start over, but it, it, we should set a time. And it probably won't be in my tenure as a, as a policymaker, but it may be in yours. And, and uh, I, I, I feel that we should probably look forward to that time. Thanks. Jim? Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, it certainly has been a very interesting discussion many issues that we, we've talked about. Um, it seems to me the common thread is, is a lot that really isn't, not that it's not education related, well, what's good, you know, the teacher in the classroom, what they're teaching versus all the other myriad problems <coughs> outside that these kids are bringing into the thing. And how we expect our public school teachers to be able to, to address all that with support we're gonna be giving them to, to deal with these issues. I mean, it's, it's massive, the, the thing that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I heard was about the civics education, adding that to the curriculum. Other than that, it's all, you know, different, a lot of lot mm -hmm. on the plate. And, um, uh, you know, and how do we support those teachers to deal with these issues? The two issues that I wanted to bring up, and the you know, first one, Thinking back of what Richard said about the opiate uh, thing, um, I've talked to a lot of people in the building and outside, and, and they feel there's a real uh, major issue with use of marijuana, marijuana among uh, young students. Um, we're going to be opening a medical marijuana facility you know, a couple of blocks from this facility. It's probably going to be legalized come November on the ballot question. How do we say, you know, to these, especially the young kids, you know, this is not really a thing that you should be doing that at your age. So, I mean, that's going to be another issue, I think, you know, that the schools mm -hmm. have to be, be dealing with and, and, and how do we address that. The race class issue, you know, most parents, you know, they're working two or three jobs, working class, and they um, a lot is, um, don't speak uh, English. So how do, how do we engage them, you know? It's always the squeaky wheel that's, you know, sort of gets the juice and, and you know, so how do we engage those the, those parents and those families? They're all working <laughs> constantly, you know. Um, but they send their kid to us every day expecting that we're going to be there for the, for those, those those children. And the other issue, and I, I know Madam May just said that that tragedy in some young family is the issue of bullying. I'm not going to talk about that, but if that is an issue, uh, in the schools and are uh, we looking looking at that. But these are all issues that really, you know, the teacher that's coming in to teach um, history now is dealing with all these other issues that are coming in. You know, it's, I, you know, God bless the teachers and how they're gonna address all these that we're putting out there for mm -hmm. them to, to address. And when <coughs> the scores aren't exactly what they should be, everybody's criticizing, but it's, it's a massive undertaking, and, and unfortunately, on the federal level, we're not going to get much assistance and, and stuff. But so, so it's it's a challenge for all of us. Uh, there's no question, and I, I'm somewhat fretful about how we how we manage that. But um, definitely, you know, I don't know if anyone's from teachers union, but I mean, they they, they have their hands full, and, and yeah. what do we expect from them? And, and are we going to burn them out, you know, after a couple of years, you know? Certainly we would, a lot of us, when we, in the system, you know, those teachers were there 40, 50 years, and they knew everybody coming into the system, those families, mm -hmm. and there was a connection. I just don't think we see that anymore with, the you know, the, a lot of these young teachers. <coughs> that, you know, that, how long are they here? I don't know if there's any stats on that, but, um, you know, at what point do we demand or expect a bunch of them that they naturally going to get burned up?
that's my few things to bring in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Patty was ahead of you now. Yeah. Matthew, yeah. That's wrong. A relatively quick thing, I want to echo what others have said or did our whatever. One question maybe to you, Madam Mayor, if you and the Vice Mayor and the city and the school department could weigh in on what successful examples there have been in the last 10 or 20 years of the joint, there's been a couple joint task forces. There used to be the digital divide one that had the school and the city um, representatives from both. They did some good work. The early education task force, I think, had some representation from both. The kids council is something that has um, representation from both. So if we could look to our own examples of what mm -hmm. has been proven to be an effective way to actually move forward on many of these issues, I think it would be useful for all of us because mm -hmm. we all, there's, en there's energy among all of us to actually address, d do whatever we can to move these forward to actually get something done, um, addressing many of these <coughs> key issues we've identified. So I would, I would look to specifically have some, someone look back at what have been the most mm -hmm. effective, talk to people involved, and then make sure that as we move forward, we incorporate those lessons into a way that we can work together, which might be a joint task force on each of the issues we pick up or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, um, and sorry to leave it out of my, my time earlier, really but I think that in terms of sort of what we might be reporting back, I think it's critically important that the council in this case keeps <coughs> the school committee abreast of what the developments are in the city manager search. Um, I, I just think that and depending on where you're at, I think that you have a community on the edge, you have a community that is very um, interested in who the next person's gonna be. Um, I, I think for my money, I'm very um, concerned that, and I don't know this, but that there may be a, a, a thought that, you know, in doing a search very internationally and very globally that the most important thing um, in my opinion, that one needs to know it to be the city manager is to understand the city, its people, and understand who it is that they're serving. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, and I'm just a little biased because I'm like from here, right? <laughs> but um, I think it's critically important that when you think about uh, the next person that you're going to bring on, um, you know, whoever that may be, that lucky person, um, they're inheriting a sort of great thing, a great thing that can be tuned, fine-tuned, and be better. We, I think we'd all agree, but mm -hmm. let's not lose sight on the fact that we are probably one of the best-run cities in America. And so in, in, in all of the things that aren't perfect about us, I think that we have the intellectual power and the um, sense of pride to get us there. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to make sure that, um, and that's my own sort of um, hesitance on that whole process, but I do think that it can easily be lost when you get into these processes, particularly if you are putting yourself in the stead that we need to have somebody who's new and from somewhere else to kind of inject their whatever their magic is that they bring here. Um, and so I think for my money, it would be good that the council um, or whoever um, is pretty intentional about keeping the committee abreast on how that process is going you know, maybe even have a conversation on what the thoughts are around who the new person is. I know sometimes you, you have these opportunities to do it. I had one just recently when we brought a new superintendent on, although it's at a different scale, I think being a part of that gave me a lot of, um, a better understanding, quite frankly, of who we needed for the time and what that person ought to look like in the moment, um, along with some of the other members who served on that <coughs> committee with me. But I, I don't want that to get lost on the council members as they go into their deliberations and thinking about how they bring on this new person. It is critically important that you understand and know this city. One thing that's great about this city is, more likely than not, the people who are making the decisions for you, they actually know and understand you in a way that you don't see in other places just because of um, the way the communities are less connected. So that, that, I, just, I know that wasn't on the list, but I think that might no, be a good... Just, the point. idea is to get it all out. And yeah, but well, I think that one Get is, it out and we'll figure it out. Right, and just to kind of, when you're talking about reporting back, sometimes mm -hmm. we could lose kind of just because everybody's busy, we might not be as lock and step with you, and obviously you'll make the decision collectively, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it's just a good, sure. good thing. Okay, we're going to go to Jan, then Mark, and to David, and then Emily. Thank you. Yeah, this has been a very interesting conversation. I, I do want to put in a, a vote for what it's worth to really try to focus on the early childhood. Because I think that is a natural point of collaboration. 
And I also just wanted to throw out there that um, on a lot of these issues, we have the council has committee hearings that are open to the public, um, and school committee members are obviously very welcome to come and provide a school-focused perspective. So when we have a, a hearing on human services, there's a natural way that you guys would you know, have valuable input or civic community or even housing or when we're talking about the city manager search. Um, and I'm assuming that that search will have a advisory committee composed of a few counselors because of the open meeting law, maybe our new school superintendent, maybe a, a school committee member or, you know, I mean, so there will certainly, Excuse me. I don't think there's any mm -hmm. chance that the school perspective will be not heard in that process, but I think it's worth thinking about whether there are other opportunities and you know, I'm perfectly willing just to hear suggestions from any of you about committee hearings or topics that you would like mm -hmm. brought, raised to the fore because they impact, because they start in the schools or they impact the schools most directly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, Jan, you beat me to it. I mean, I was going to suggest something similar that you know, even when they're, even when yeah. each body is having a roundtable conversation, you know, maybe. You know, maybe the vice chair from the school committee comes and sits in on the round tables that this council has, or you know, I'll come in and sit in on the ones that, that, that you have. Um, you know, it might be a lot to have everybody come because then that dominates in the whole way, different way. But maybe there, 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 there got to be, there has to be other opportunities for us to at least connect, either through a, you know, a, a person or together, um, and and the committee meetings. You know, so. Actually, May 11th, we're scheduling today. I don't, Annie was supposed to call the clerk's office. We're going to do a, a, speaking of the opioid crisis, and last term, Vice Mayor Benzan um, started, had a round table on the opioid crisis, but it was really, it was sort of a bigger picture conversation. We had folks from the state, you know, talking a lot about what that picture looked like. We're going to be doing something May 11th um, that's really much more geared towards Cambridge and Cambridge providers. So that, you know, somebody from the school department who the Health Alliance will be there, Department, department of Health, Human Resources, all the, you know, nonprofits. Um, but we could have someone from the schools there, you know, as part of that conversation as well. But how do we, we just need to, we need to think that all the time, right? Like right. just, you know, how do we involve, you know, how do we involve the city in this? How do we involve the schools in this? Um, okay. And then, oh, I'm sorry. And then just lastly, I would just say, Patty, yeah, I think we all touched on this a little bit. And Patty mentioned that, uh, about the issue around poverty being sort of a part of all of these conversations. I mean, I've said it a hundred times, you know, I think the schools are doing an incredible job, but, you know, you could have the best teachers and the best facilities and the best policies and the best curriculum, but if kids are still going home to situations where they're not being fed consistently, they're not, you know, their heat's off, that, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, they're living in a very crowded apartment, they don't have a solid early childhood education, mm -hmm. <laughs> the schools are just putting band-aids on things that are much larger social issues and that's where we have to really as a joint body focus on I think because I think that's the biggest thing thank you David R Richard left the room but I just wanted to say that to, in, for the for the other members that this the council is right now looking at the process that we're going to use in the selection of a new city manager and quite honestly we're looking at the process that was used by the school committee the last time because the school committee has developed a process and they've refined that process over the past several uh, searches and there has never been a search process for a city manager in this form of government. <laughs> so this is the first time we're really doing a, a... I hope you learned some lessons from our searches. Well, I, I, I think we have and I, and I think that there's no perfect search Richard, I'm talking about your, what your, the point that you made, and I will say that uh, Fred did attend the meeting we had last week, and we're having another meeting on April 6th. We're in the very early stages, but developing the RFP, getting draft language out, and, and uh, city manager for, for the search, okay. and, and uh, right. looking at kind of how the school committee did it with the search for the superintendent in adapting a citywide process for that, and and I think that um, I think we'll be able to do it, and I think that 
knowing my colleagues, I, one thing that I can assure folks is that we have been very, very lucky in having Rich Rossi and Bob Healy for as long as we did, two people that were deeply, deeply committed to public education. And I think that there is not a shadow of a doubt in my mind that a major priority of the council is going to be finding a new city manager that is equally as committed to public education in this community. And I know that's not going to be easy to find because I think it was very unique to find Bob was a former teacher, Rich had gone through the, the system here, you know, but um, we, and we want to be able to continue, and, and Louie and Gina are over there smiling, but we want to continue the investment that the city has made in the public schools, in the capital program going forward, in making sure that that's not compromised in this transition, so. Thank you, David. And I, I don't know if the school committee side knows, I, I think I'm correct in saying this, that I believe our police commissioner has given his notice. Mm -hmm. So we're in a lot of deep in transition. Emily and then Dennis. Just a little bit um, from what Nadine was talking about in terms of transition and what schools will be like. And I think some, several of us have talked about we need to have some kind of district plan to be in compliance with the ESE, but with the new superintendent coming forward, we would want to be making some type of five-year plan for what our goal, goals are. Mm -hmm. But I would like that to do that jointly with the council because I feel like you all are elected to sort of represent a larger perspective, a civic perspective, and a city perspective. You understand where people are going when they leave our schools, et cetera. So I can envision a process of envisioning CPS that would have um, council representatives and human services and other people thinking about where, where do we want to take our school system within the context of where our city is going. Hey, don't get carried away, Emily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dennis? Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> I would say get carried away. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, the Harrington School had its issues, but um, the Say Yes to Education program did follow the kids in school, through high school, and after. And uh, a guy, a wonderful guy named Jose Ribeiro and Ann Larkin um, were the people that did that. And they, I was part of that program, and they were just remarkable. Yeah. And a very high percentage of kids from a very tough background went on to college and graduated. So there might be some lessons yeah, there. And Ann is very open on that information. And I want to concur with Jan and the others on early childhood education. I, uh, like most of you, I am adamant that uh, the move that the city is, uh, is promoting is a great step forward. And hopefully um, that and learning about all the cultures, I'm not sure how much there is about cultural education. You probably do a lot of it, but I'm going off to Israel in a few weeks, and um, one of the thoughts is learning about each other's religion uh, to help break barriers down. Maybe it's even cultural as well. It's not just, civics are important, don't I? But learning about other cultures <coughs> could be helpful in opening dialogue. Thank you, you have a reference. Um, thank you. Thank That's you. part of the, the body here. Right. Thank you. I'm going to have you bless us before we leave. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. I think this was a really good meeting. It's um, 7.33. Uh, so I do I thank you, everyone, for your time, your treasure, and your talent coming here this evening. This is a beginning. It's really about how do we develop this this collaborative body. I'm going to be very quick because people have said, I, if I could have just a few more minutes of your, your time, I'll be very brief. Things that I did not put on, but I, that either heard that I want to uh, just add. Uh, when we think about cultural, I put down cultural proficiency. We talked about it, it could be called race and class, it could be cultural competency. I think it should be a citywide conversation. We should look at both sides of the aisle, and I think we should start with us first. It starts from the top and it works its way down. We're not willing to do it. Well, I don't know why we should expect anyone else to want to do it. I call it city climate. 
um, communication. I will work with the vice chair and the vice mayor on me and with our secretary and clerk about trying to increase and better our communication between um, both bodies. Um, sharing our information. The other two things that we should talk about, figure out um, a way to do this, and we haven't done this since the days of Bert Giroux, we do not tell our story well at all. Who's Bert Giroux? He used to be, <laughs> he used to be a public relations person. And the school committee was on, I think, Newsweek as the best school oh. committee in the country, and we haven't oh, yeah. made that mark. I still have that magazine. I'm sure, I'm sure. Okay, let's not get, it, let's not get crazy. Okay, so I just want to, I just want to say, to say that, you know, cultural competency, social, emotional, slash bullying. I looked at the school department side, uh, and thank, for all of you that y y your well wishes and condolences was wonderful, but, and I thank you for it. The long and the short of it is, um, I lost my niece because someone bullied her. Mm -hmm. And the school department had a position on it, but the city didn't have a position on it. So she went home and, got, and was bullied and ended up shooting herself. And so it says to me, it's really re, it's reinvigorated or re, there's a word for it, I can't think of it right now. Com dedicated, committed myself mm -hmm. to saying it's not a conversation we can have in schools alone. Right. It has to be a citywide conversation because that, that bullying leaves, and it's social, bullying social emotional, but it leaves the school, it follows you home, it follows you to the mm -hmm. after school, it follows you to your job, it follows right. you back home. Because when, when, when you feel there's no place that you can go, mm -hmm. that that's your only option. Then, then we have, it's a really sad day. And no, it wasn't Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I know we do a lot, but do we do enough? Because we all know of instances of intolerance, or bullying, or just being <coughs> mean and nasty, and where does it all start? So I really would like to see us have a conversation about not only having our schools safe, but our city safe for our children and our families. So the, the, those are some of the issues that um, I would like to talk uh, talk on. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, this was a very good meeting. I look forward to going forward. Bagels and quiche at the mayor's office in a few weeks. Great. Oh, good. You know, I uh, think that is the most important thing we could do as two bodies. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, on that, on a motion by so moved, Fred Fantini yeah. to yeah. adjourn yeah. this yeah. meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much.